you can use those stories that are sad. When you do, you generally want to have some kind of silver lining or some kind of important lesson that you learned out of it. You don't want it to just be a sad story because people don't want to just hear a sad story. You know, generally, you want a tragedy to have some kind of lesson. Welcome to the Online Genius Podcast, where host and renegade thinking beer brewing lawyer turned online entrepreneur Bobby Klink proves that building and protecting your online genius doesn't have to be rocket science. Bobby and his expert guests break down online marketing and the legal stuff so you can stop sweating the small stuff and get back to building your amazing business. Now, here's your host, Bobby Kling. Hey there. Welcome to episode 90 of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Klink, and I am absolutely giddy about today's show. I'm giddy because we're talking about one of my favorite subjects again, storytelling. And actually this week, we're going to get into what I kind of think of as like my favorite part of storytelling. And it's something that a lot of other people aren't talking about. We're going to be talking about what I, I mean, what I just call personal vignettes. But the idea is that we're going to be talking about the little stories we tell, not the big monumental stories necessarily that we talked about last week. Now, this is the second in a two-part series that we're doing on storytelling. Last week in episode 89, we did part one. And in that episode, we talked about kind of the power of stories, that we're wired for stories, and that stories let us remember things better and and kind of remember lessons and remember themes and all of those things. So that's what we talked about last week. And then we talked about two kind of pivotal kinds of stories you need. Your origin story, which is hugely important, and a lot of people talk about that. And in a lot of different programs, you'll see people kind of talking how to create your origin story. But we went over it last week as well. And then we also talked about kind of your story where you are the guide and your customer or potential customer is the hero. So the classic example is case studies. So that's what we talked about last week. Those are the things that really you're hearing, you'll hear a lot of people talk about. But I'm an honest believer. I really do believe that personal vignettes are equally as important, if not more important. Honestly, these are the things that are kind of the core part of how I nurture my fans. And so I wanted to do an episode all about personal vignette stories. And that's what this week's episode is. So we're talking about that this week, and we're going to talk about, you know, why use them, what makes good ones, and also you know, how to kind of work on this skill, because I hear a lot of people tell me that this is something they can't do naturally or or don't feel like they can do naturally. And we're going to talk about three different kinds of personal vignettes that I think you should have in kind of your story arsenal, if you will. So that's what we've got in store for this episode. We're going to dive in in a second. But before we do, this episode, as always, is brought to you by the Online Genius Podcast Community on Facebook. I love coming here, talking about things and and giving you information, but I really want to interact with you, engage with you, talk with you, not talk at you. And I can't do that in a podcast, but I can do it inside the community. The community is a free Facebook group where we talk about all things online marketing, digital marketing, building businesses, doing it the right way, legal stuff for business, if you want to talk about that. And like I say many times, if you want to talk to me about beer, I'll gladly have that discussion too. Basically, it's a place for online entrepreneurs who are trying to do it the right way. And by the right way, I mean building the right foundations, doing this for the long haul, not looking for shortcuts, not looking for secrets that are going to kind of make them rich overnight, but entrepreneurs who really want to build a sustainable business. That's what we're we're all about in that community. So I'd love for you to join. It's absolutely free. You can join by heading over to youronlinegenius.com forward slash community. Again, youronlinegenius.com forward slash community. 
Now, with that, I want to dive in to talking about personal vignettes. So, as you can kind of tell, personal vignettes, it's personal. So, it's kind of stories about you and about your life. And vignettes, I use to kind of say that these are generally smaller stories. They're generally not big stories, and we'll we'll talk about what's involved in them before. But the concept is that, look, we've all heard that we need to build the no like trust factor. In other words, people are going to buy from us because they feel like they know us, they like us, and they trust us. And personal vignettes are, in my view, the best way you can do this. They are a way that you give people a glimpse into your world. They, you give people a way to see who you really are, to understand your business, your life, and your personality. And the personality comes up in kind of the way you tell the stories and the stories you choose. For example, a lot of people who are on my email list know that I get kind of edgy in my stories and I push the line with humor, but that's just who I am. So people get to see that through my vignettes. But basically, the concept is that these are the stories that let people feel like they know you in spite of the fact that they've never met you. Heck, they may not have even interacted with you in a kind of online space, but they feel like they know you because they've heard you tell these kinds of stories over and over and over again. And if you hear someone tell these stories long enough, you feel connected to them. You feel like you know them, like they're a friend. And so that's the power. It allows you to connect with your fans, with your followers, with your customers in a way that kind of big rehearsed, your origin story doesn't do. Your origin story has its value and your case studies have their value, but they're not how people truly get to know you. And that's what personal vignettes are about. And how, let's talk for a second about how you will deploy these personal vignettes. In my view, these are the things, these are the stories that are perfect for nurturing your leads. They are a way that on a weekly basis, people get a little more information about you. And so, They are the perfect thing for your weekly emails. Again, if you follow me, I'm going to tell you, I believe you should be sending an email to your list every single week. I also believe you should be creating content every single week. Now, your content won't always have stories in it, but your email can. Now, if you're on my email list, you get a personal vignette most weeks. Now, not every week. Some weeks I don't do it. You know, I don't remember a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, I'm not sure which. I sent an email where I said like, you know, insert, like my subject line was something like insert pithy planning quote here. And I just kind of talked about planning. I didn't really tell a story, but most weeks I'm telling a story like this week in my email, as I'm recording this, I told the story of being stranded in a bay on a boat with my wife who had recently had uh, ACL surgery, my toddler daughter, my friend who was by the end suffering a bit of hypothermia and his pregnant wife and their toddler and us having to eventually abandon ship, get onto another boat in four to five foot waves. And then the guy trying to take us home, not knowing where he was going. So I told that story and I used it and tied it into the message I was sending. But if you think about it, now if people see me, if people are on my list, you know, they get a sense of kind of me and who I am and and get to feel like they know something about me in my life. Now, that's kind of your weekly email. So I believe personal vignettes are perfect for your weekly email. The these are the things that should in many ways be the reason why people want to get your emails and read your emails. Now, the next piece though is I think they're also perfect for your promo emails. Now, not every promo email, but when you're in a promo sequence, for example, during a launch, after a webinar, or after a product launch formula, if you did videos, you're going to send a lot of emails over a short period of time. 
And if they're all just straight to business talking about things, you know, talking about your product or case studies or something like that, people aren't going to like it. It's going to feel too promotional and corporate and, and just kind of dry. Now, if you can add some personal vignettes and some personal tidbits to those promo emails, that makes it more fun. It adds fun and flair to those emails that will make them, you know, kind of something that people look forward to. And let's be honest, if you get a, a reputation for using those kind of things in your promo emails and more people are opening your promo emails, that's a good thing. And that will help you sell when you get to that phase. Now, also, and I'll be honest, I'm not as good with this, but personal vignettes are perfect for Instagram stories. And I say I'm not that good at it because I'm not that good at remembering to do Instagram stories. But if you think about it, the whole concept there is doing personal vignettes. Like one of my friends who I've ha had on the, the podcast before, Tiffany Lee Bymaster, also known as Coach Glitter, she does stories on a regular basis that are personal vignettes of like her riding her Peloton and her juicing celery. I mean, she does other things, but she does a lot about that. So you really get to see how she lives her life. And so you're going to feel like you know her. And so it's going to nurture you. You're going to feel connected to her. So that's kind of some of the ways that you're going to use these stories. And so that gives you a sense. Like some of the stories are written. Sometimes it's spoken. You could do the same thing on Facebook Lives. You could talk about things that are happening in your life right then. And that can have a huge connection. So with that, I want to talk about what makes a vignette a good vignette for you to use in your business. Now, the first, and in my view, kind of the obvious things it, thing is, it needs to give a window into your life. It could be your life, it could be your business, it could be your personality, but it needs to be a story that somehow lets people feel connected to you. The point of these stories is not to tell things that are, you know, people are like, okay, fine, I don't really care. And this means, you have to be authentic. You have to talk about what you're doing, but in an authentic way. It can't sound canned. It can't be a, you know, so I was in Starbucks and, and you just tell a story without any kind of real context or, or chance to get to know you. It, so it's got to do that. But then the next level and kind of what gives you some bonus points is if it's something that's instantly relatable to your fans and potential fans. And let me try to give you an example of that. If your fans, like one of the things that they want is to be present for their family, right? If, if you're serving mompreneurs, for example, and, and part of what they want is to be able to really kind of have a business that allows them to live the life they want and be present for their family, then telling stories about your family is an obvious way to do that because you know that your fans can relate to family, to spending time with family, family, to actually kind of enjoying that. So that is something you can do again. And I use that as an example, but another example is a story about something that is instantly relatable to almost everyone. And for this, I'm going to give you an example of a story I told. I sent an email and this email just, it killed. I got tons of responses from people, copywriters who were saying how great it was, but also like from just people on my list responding. And the subject line was, please pray for me or pray for me. I don't remember which. And then the first line of the email was because I'm headed to the Washington, or to the DC DMV. In other words, I was going to have to go to the DMV and I told the story about how I was turning 41. And so I was going to have to, to get a new license because my license was expiring. And under this thing called the Real ID Act, I had to prove that I existed. And so I tell this story because people can relate to the DMV and, and bureaucracy and, and how it's going to be a painful experience, most likely. So I told that story. And the gist of it was I was basically going to do a birthday sale. So you could see I could kind of tie it into everything. So that email, that's an example of like an instantly relatable situation in your life that you can use to tell a story. 
Now, more bonus points here if you can tie it to a business lesson or to a theme. Again, with that DMV, the example here is that I was going to have a sale for my birthday and I was giving people, I think, $41 off in uh, any of my templates in honor of my 41st birthday. And so the DMV story let me kind of tie into it was my birthday and oh, so that's good news for you. I'm giving you a present. So that's the way you can do it. Another way is if it's just a story, when I talked about using vignettes as part of your weekly email, when you can find a personal vignette that can kind of have an obvious tie-in to whatever that weekly content is, whatever the message is that you want to pull out from that weekly content, you have an obvious winner. So those are kind of general guidelines, but let's talk about some other things about what makes a vignette a good vignette to use. Generally, they should evoke some kind of emotion. So funny is always good. That's the DMV example. Talking about that is something that is funny. If if it might make them laugh, if it might make them chuckle, anything like that is good. Heartwarming also a good subject. I mean, if you can make them feel, you know, uh, kind of, you know, just good and, and happy and in a good place from your story, that is a good place to be. Now, sad can also work from time to time, but I, you generally have to be careful with sad. And generally, if you're going to tell a story that is sad, you want there to be something that's not, you know, just leaving them very sad at the end that generally won't work. Angry, you can be careful with, but as long as they're angry at someone, not you, but someone else, it can work. But generally, you want it to be joyful and and, and kind of uplifting in some way or another. Now, another thing, though, I want to talk about here is if the story involves you doing something silly or dumb, it often works well. And I know this seems weird to say, but People on my email list know that a lot of my stories are about me doing something kind of dumb and my wife playing the hero. And there's a long line and a tradition of this, of playing the jester. And it makes you very relatable to people because, let's be honest, everybody screws up. And so telling people about how you screwed up can be helpful. Now, you don't want to make yourself look inept with respect to whatever you do in your business. It, you generally want it to be something else. So like the, the themes of mine are often that I'm clueless about things in life and my wife kind of, you know, smacks me upside the head and helps me understand it. And, and just so you know, like those are actually true stories when I'm doing it. You shouldn't make these things up, obviously. But if you have things like that, you can do it. I can remember, you know, someone in my uh, community and in a bunch of other communities I'm in, she was doing, I think it was like a, a Facebook Live or something, and she's a she does cooking of some sort. And as I recall, like I think she forgot to put the top on a blender or something. So she has this picture of stuff going everywhere. I mean, that's a great story, right? Because it's relatable. And it's something everyone has done. Everyone has forgotten or messed something up when they're cooking, even if it's, you know, in that case, kind of related to what you do. A classic example of that is Julia Child. She like was always messing things up on the air. And that was fine because that's who she was. So you can do that within reason. If you are making a mistake or doing something silly, it often works out well. So that's kind of ideas about what makes a good vignette generally. Now I want to step in to give you a, a quick practice pointer here. Because when I've talked about this before, in smaller contexts, I've had people say, look, that's great. I love your stories, but I don't, I don't know how to even start. I don't know where to, to, to kind of find these things. And what I want to tell you is, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the different kinds of vignettes, there are personal vignettes everywhere. And you just need to kind of wake up to that and start to realize that and see them. And I think the problem is that often you are thinking it has to be some big consequential story, and it doesn't have to be. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's not. And so my practice pointer here is that if this isn't something that comes naturally to you, 
If you struggle with this, I strongly suggest that you get a journal that becomes your story journal. Use whatever you like, just a place to write it down. I am a big fan of physical journals for this and actually using pen to paper. I actually, you know, even though I I now can kind of see stories everywhere, I still actually keep one of those slender little journals. It's like a soft back journal that, and I have it on my, on my desk. And sometimes I just want to write something down in there. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. And, and part of this is about just capturing something that happened right? So getting used to noticing things, kind of like a a gratitude journal. At first, you'll struggle and it feels weird. But eventually, if you do gratitude journaling all the time, like your problem isn't, well, how do I come up with five? Your your problem is, how do I stop at 100, right? So it just becomes more natural to you. The same thing will happen if you start doing this with a story journal. So uh, part of it is literally just getting yourself aware and forcing yourself to capture the stories. Now, another part of it is you can use this to practice writing the stories. When you first start doing this, every story is going to be way too long, and you're going to have to work at cutting it back and shortening it and tightening it. But the concept is that that my first goal here is just capture the stories. Because even if you use a story and it's way too long, that's good. That's better than not using a story than just sending like a newsletter that that you know doesn't have any personality or you know, just doing lessons online that don't have anything about your life. So I want you to practice capturing the stories and then practice writing them. So you can do that as well. So those are kind of the practical pointers on how to do this. But now I want to dive into the three different kinds of personal vignettes. And there might be more, but this is how I categorize them and how I think you can categorize them and get some value if you think about them in this way. So the first type of personal vignette is stories about your business. So these aren't your origin stories, so they're not kind of this big, huge thing necessarily. They're smaller stories, often about how you evolved in your business. So in some ways, they're kind of like mini origin stories, but they're not necessarily really kind of, you know, as dialed in. Now, you should be able to come up with a collection of different stories about your business that relate to different themes. And let me explain this broadly. When I say your business, if your business is teaching people how to create certain kinds of artwork, anything about art and developing art skills to me is about your business, even if it's not about your business. Now, if you're like me and you are talking to other business people, it'll often be, you know, very definitely about your business. Another example, if you were someone and you teach people how to cook, you know, stories about cooking here, right? So, so in other words, it's about your business or about the topic of your business. And so you should be able to come up with a bunch of different stories that relate to kind of different themes that you'll be talking about. So think of pivotal moments in your journey that you can use to tell in a story and that will make a point and be relatable. That's the idea here. So you want to kind of come up with these. And I'm going to give you some examples here of stories that I tell. If you followed me for a while, you've probably heard one or more of these. One of the stories I like to tell is about how I was talking with my friend Jillian last, I don't know, late summer, early fall. Uh, And at that point, I was offering a membership site for the legal stuff. And I was thinking about creating courses about the legal stuff. And she was talking to me and she said, look, you're making stuff way too complicated. I think what people really want are the templates. And I think that's where you ought to focus. And she told me that, and it was a bit of a bummer because I was excited about creating courses. I wanted to do that. And I wanted to go on and, and, you know, create a series of different courses about the legal stuff. Like I was going to do one for course creators and one for service providers and one for VAs. And that's what I had in mind. She said, I think that's not what you should do. And I was coachable here. 
And so I went and I looked at the numbers. And when I looked at the numbers, I discovered something crazy. So I had spent the summer focusing on trying to sell people into my membership site, this legal membership. And I called it a membership. Really, it was kind of a course, or I don't know what it was, but it was something like a course or a membership about the legal stuff. That's where I was spending 95% of my time. It's where I was spending 95% of my marketing dollars, but it was only 35% of my revenue. 65% of my revenue was coming from people just buying my templates in the background. And I was putting very little time and very little effort into it. And so Jillian really kind of, boom, got me focused in the right place. And from there, I made the decision to go all in on the templates, to stop selling a membership, to not create courses, to not do any of that, and to make my templates the centerpiece of my business and to actually create a product that was basically just all my templates. And that's how the template library was born. Okay. So that's the story. And I tell that story often to make the point that we often are focused on the wrong things and we need to focus on what matters and be willing to be coachable and be willing to look at the actual evidence and then double down on what's working and cut what's not working. It's kind of like I talk about the 80-20 rule and things like that. That story captures all of that. That's one of my common themes. Now, here's another story that you've probably heard me tell. Last year at Amy Porterfield's live event, the Entrepreneur Experience, the, the kind of the first night, it was like the night before it really started, some people got to go to a meet and greet. And there was this big, huge line of people waiting to take pictures with Amy. And I had met, like had lunch with some of the people beforehand. And and so they were, you know, trying to get me in line. And so I did come in line, but everyone was excited to take a picture with Amy. Well, at this point, I had already been working with her and her team on some stuff. And so I was kind of excited to get to meet her team. And one of her team members was up at the front of the line. And so when I got up to the front, I was like, hey, I want to take a picture with you. And so we take a picture, which was awesome. I think she did it because I'm not good at taking selfies, but she did it with my phone and we did it. And then I took a picture with Amy. Then later that night, I'm back in my hotel room and I'm going through my pictures and I realize that when I was taking a picture with her team member, Amy Porterfield had photobombed me and had photobombed me with her tongue out (laughs) in a hilarious picture. And so I texted that picture to my wife. I live on the East Coast. We were on the West Coast. So I send this to her and... When I do, I don't put any comment, and so I go to bed. I wake up the next morning with a text from my wife saying, why are you sending pictures of me, of you, with random women? And <laughs> it was like, oh, Bobby, dumb. And, and you know, I explained it was fine, but I used this, that story to relate to the fact that we are in a world often where other people don't understand what we do. Like the people in our real life often have no clue what online marketers do and online entrepreneurs. A lot of them think, I heard someone say this, think we're like in a cult or something. And so they don't get it. And I use that story to kind of make that point and to make the point that there's value in having community of people you know, in your world. So I tell that story. Another story I tell is that when I first started to get into the online space, in spite of the fact that I graduated from Harvard Law School, have like sterling credentials, I thought to myself, literally, who am I to offer legal advice to online entrepreneurs? And so I use that story because I want to make the point to people that imposter syndrome is real and that everyone suffers from it because I want to help people overcome that. And so that's another example of something related to my business. So I'll stop there. But if you follow me, you've heard a lot of stories I've told. I talk about the more cowbell initiative and things like that, that are all have a story mixed in. And they're all stories about my business and my evolution in the area of my business. And so That's the first category. So these should be pretty easy for you to think about. You should be able to come up with kind of pivotal moments of how you developed as whatever it is you do. And again, it could be developed as an entrepreneur, but it could be developed as an artist or developed as 
you know, a, a cook or develop as a dog trainer if that's what you help people with. The point is stuff about your business and your skill set that are relatable, though. You've got to keep in mind it's got to be relatable, but those are the first category. That should be obvious, and you should be able to put together a good list of them that you can then deploy over and over again because they're powerful and make your point for you. So these are ones that you're going to come up with and they will become, you know, repeats. I mean, I don't want to say repeats. You don't repeat yourself all the time, but you tell the story a lot of times. So those, you know, are important and that's the first category. Now, the second type of personal vignette is kind of big stories from your life that aren't related to your business or kind of the area of your expertise. These are things that you should immediately recognize as stories. So if you tuned in to the last episode, episode 89, where I talked about, I at one point thought about like going to this place called Story District here in in Washington, D.C. to learn the art of storytelling. Well, these are the kind of stories that you would immediately recognize as a possible subject for something like that, for a big speech or you know some big story you were going to give. And what I'm going to tell you is everything, everyone, sorry, has had interesting things happen to them in life. So you should be able to come up with things like stories to tell from your life. Now, some will be things that are uplifting and inspirational. So like if you've run a marathon, that's something that could be an obvious fodder for a story because in pretty much any business or area you're in, you're probably going to want to make the point that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Or you're going to talk about having been able to kind of, you know, set a goal and make it happen. Same thing, like if you did any other kind of athletic thing, like a tough mutter or any of these crazy things that people do, that's an obvious area that can be uplifting and inspirational and you can tie in to some other message. Similarly, if you had to overcome some kind of monumental obstacle, same kind of thing. That's going to over, you know, going to help inspire and uplift people. And it's not about you necessarily, it's about helping to inspire them. These are things that are kind of obvious and you shouldn't have to think very hard about how you can deploy them. Now, some stories are going to be sad. And this is where I told you that sometimes you can tell a story that can evoke sadness. One that that I told earlier this year in an email uh, was the story of answering the phone one day, a week or so before I was going to start my last year in law school, and hearing my mom say, they're okay. That was literally the first words out of her mouth. And it was the story about how my dad and my uncle were in a plane crash in their private plane. The story ultimately didn't end up as happy as my mom's initial, they're okay, would make it seem. My uncle passed away uh, within a week. My dad uh, fought for his life and eventually came out of it. But the point of the story was actually to talk about how I was down there, but I was trying to balance this part of my life with my law school and with a, a competition I had and an ability to do that. And in some sense, having to kind of make a decision about whether I was going to go on with life because, or go on with my, 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 my this competition because life was getting in the way and it related to the podcast episode. So that's an example. Another, you know, other examples of things that maybe have happened to you, if you've had to lay off an employee, that could be something that, that is not a happy thing, but there could be a message in there. If you've dealt with tragedy, that could be something that you could talk about. For example, Rachel Hollis in her, one of her books talks about her brother's suicide and talks about how she used that to, you know, and how she kind of overcame it. So you can use those stories that are sad. When you do, you generally want to have some kind of silver lining or some kind of important lesson that you learned out of it. You don't want it to just be a sad story because people don't want to just hear a sad story. You know, generally, you want a tragedy to have some kind of lesson. <laughs> An example to maybe make this a little bit more lighthearted, if you watch Breaking Bad, I mean, I, I would never tell that story or the end of that story as, you know, 
a story because you don't want it to just be a downer, you know? And so you want there to be some kind of uplifting moment. Switching gears uh, a a bit here, not a bit, actually good. Another area of fodder here are crisis stories that worked out in the end. Now, you may have heard there's this old concept that comedy is tragedy plus time. In other words, something that seems tragic at the time will end up being a comedy after some time passes. And this is definitely true if it's not necessarily tragedy, but it's like crisis or something that seems like crisis. One email I told was an email when I was a prosecutor, or sorry, it was a story of when I was a prosecutor and I was out at a happy hour with the other young prosecutors and I was on duty, which meant I had to carry a phone so that agents like ATF agents, DEA agents, FBI agents, if they needed to talk to a lawyer in the prosecutor's office after hours, they would call that number. So I'm out for happy hour and get a call from an ATF agent I know who says, I need your permission to use deadly force. We have a barricaded subject who has killed two agents. And literally, you can imagine I was terrified, had no clue what to do, and I'm literally yelling at at the other prosecutors to get our boss on the phone, and I'm saying, I can't give that authorization. The agent, who was a woman, said, literally, uh, I need to talk to a prosecutor with some balls. And, you know, this is like all happening in the thing. And then all of a sudden, I look over, and I see one of the other young prosecutors who's with me can't control himself and is like grinning, almost laughing. And then I turn back and all of them are. It was a prank. They were screwing with me. And then all of a sudden, the the agent who was on the phone, the two agents who she told me had been killed and my boss walked in the door. It was a hazing thing. And it was this thing. And and I told that story as a, a lead in to telling people that a lot of people are scared about stuff like going live on video. And I'm like, what's the worst that can happen? It can't be as bad as this thing that I just told you happened to me. So, you know, that's the kind of thing you can tell. Anytime there's a comedy of errors that at the time did not seem comedic, but ultimately is a comedy of errors, that's something that can be funny. Now, there are obviously also going to be just funny stories. And if you have funny stories, you should be able to use those. So these kind of personal vignettes that I think of as big stories from your life, they are obvious fodder for a lot of different things, for emails, for speeches, for just that you can tie these things in all kinds of different places. So you should create a catalog of those. Again, you're not likely to use these stories over and over again as much, but sometimes you might. But you should think through those things and you're going to have a bunch of them in your life. That then takes us to the final kind of personal vignette, and really, it's my favorite. These are the things that are seemingly inconsequential. I'm talking about little like 15-second 15 15 snippets from your life. You can often use these in very, very powerful ways. And so I want to talk about these for a second. There are things happening to you every day that are potential fodder for stories. Literally, as I was putting together this outline, I quickly thought of three things I could talk about that happened to me today. First, I could talk about how, you know, for two and a half hours this morning while I was out on my walk, I was listening to Rachel Hollis on my Audible and her book, Girl, Stop Apologizing. And I could make a joke about the fact that clearly I'm not a girl. I don't really apologize very often. And that book clearly was not meant for me but I can tie it in to a a theme I talk about all the time, which is I listen to content that my fans listen to because it helps me get in their head. And so again, that's one story. Another story, the small little thing. We had, we have, we have a water machine downstairs, like one of those five gallon jug water machines. And the, the old one that we had 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 been leaking and had been leaking for about, I don't know, a, a month or so, I tried to get them to come out. There was a comedy of errors, but they f- didn't. But they finally came out yesterday, and like late yesterday. And today, I used that water machine 
And it was just this joyous feeling of not having to mess with, because like we were having to do all this crazy stuff so the old, old one didn't leak. And I could tell that little story. And I could talk about that, how even the smallest thing can bring us joy if we choose to make them joyful, because that's something I like talking about. So that's one. Now, a third story I could talk about is this morning, my daughter was like not in her room, was was somewhere else. And all of a sudden I hear a commotion in her room and I go in there to find my Rhodesian Ridgeback, who's 12 years old. And she was always a stubborn dog, but now don't give a damn about anything that anybody says, licking from this bowl that my daughter had left frozen yogurt in last night. And so my dog ended up with frozen yogurt all over her head. And so I gave her a bath, my dog a bath. I don't know, I gave her a bath probably at like almost noon. And that relates to the fact that I can do that because I'm an entrepreneur. And that's part of the reason why I do what I do, because it gives me the freedom to give my dog a bath in the middle of the day on a Tuesday because she got frozen yogurt all over herself by licking it. So you can see how like, those are like inconsequential stories. And I haven't even started to try to formulate those, but I can see how those could be stories. And I give you those examples to make the point that a story doesn't have to be anything truly earth shattering. The smallest little things happening in your life are interesting if you tell them the right way. And if you tie them into things. And again, I could make that story about my dog just truly comedic because just imagine an 85 pound dog with pink frozen yogurt or not no longer frozen, but yogurt all over her snout because that's what it was and literally on her back and she'd gotten it everywhere. And again, inconsequential story, but could be funny. Now, some of my best stories in emails that I use in promotions are actually in relatively inconsequential stories. One of them, I tell a snippet of one of my friends who's a lawyer was getting married and I was in his wedding. His dad's also a lawyer and we were about to head out. Like we were, you know, at the hotel where it was, we were in a room, we were about to all go out to the wedding and his dad looked at us and said, go to the bathroom. So what are you talking about? And we both were like, what are you talking about? We don't need to go to the bathroom. He says, never pass up an opportunity to go to the bathroom. Literally, that's the whole story. But I use that story and deploy that story in my 10-minute warning before a webinar. Literally, I think the subject line of that standard email is starting in 10 minutes and, uh, and the best advice I ever received. And I use that story to make the point of saying, hey, now would be a good time for you to go to the bathroom so you don't miss the webinar. So again, inconsequential but it's a way to make a point and to do it kind of in a funny way. And again, the story, I tell it in a slightly more, you know, joking way in the email. And I kind of make a joke about, you know, them needing to do the same thing. Now, another story, again, inconsequential. This ticks a lot of boxes. My wife is, you know, waking me up to being silly and and missing something. I talk about how one of the things that I do or try to do is go out for a long walk or run in the morning. And how you see really weird things in Washington, D.C. at 6 a.m. And how there was this period where I kept seeing people dressed like they were headed to the club. Like women in skirts so short that it would make Daisy Dukes blush. Guys in clothes that are like eight shades too bright to be worn in the daylight. And here they are at 6 a.m. like dressed like this, walking around. And I'm like, what the heck kind of job could these people have? There is no job you're going to at six or seven in the morning dressed like that. And so I talk about it, tell the story. I tell that, I come home and I tell this to my wife. She rolls her eyes and says, oh, they're doing the walk of shame, dummy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, because I had missed it. I had completely missed it. Again, true, absolutely positively true story. And that now is one of the standard stories that I tell for my last email before the before the doors close on a launch, even my non-launch launches. I, I use that as an example, and I basically say, let's not do the walk of shame. And so I tell that story. And so that's an example of, again, an inconsequential thing that happened, but that is fodder for a great story, for a great message, for something that we all have to do. So 
Again, I give these as examples. You need to think through what are things happening to you on a daily basis that you could use in this way. And this is, I'll be honest with you, a place where most people or people have the most trouble. I think people can grasp the idea of the stories about their business and the big stories in their life. But I honestly believe this is some of the best area. This is the most fertile ground for good stories. So I challenge you to just start recording interesting, funny, odd things that happen to you. Small, big, whatever. Just jot them down. At first, don't worry about how you're going to use them because at first it may not be clear how you're going to use these things. But So just collect them. Eventually, though, you're going to get to the point that you can see how you can use these little inconsequential things very quickly. And again, the example that I was able to come up with three little things from that happened to me today as I'm recording this, literally all three of those examples I gave up, uh, you know, about Rachel Hollis, about the new water machine and giving my dog a bath all happened to me today. You'll get to the point that you can just start seeing those things and, and then your problem isn't finding a story, then your problem is sifting through and figuring out, okay, what is the best story to use in a certain circumstance? So that's my challenge to you. You can do this if you'll put your mind to it. So quickly wrapping up, personal vignettes are some of the most important stories that you're going to need in your story collection. So these are how you're going to connect with your audience, how your audience is going to get kind of a, a, a real glimpse into your world, your life, your business, and start to know, like, and trust you. So that's why they're so important. And there are three types, the work-related or kind of specialty-related, the big stories from your life, and the inconsequential things. And so work on all three of those. And if you're having trouble, start a story journal and just start writing things down. And eventually it'll come and it'll become easy. So that's again my call to action. Start collecting your stories, start using personal vignettes and just try it out and see what happens. I think you will be very pleasantly surprised when you start using these that you will start getting reactions from people that you had never gotten before. So that's it for this week's episode. I'll see you back here for another episode of the Online Genius Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Online Genius Podcast. Make sure to tune in next week for more great tips, tricks, and strategies to help you build and protect your online genius.